Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see everyone. Thank you all for joining us today to launch our third annual Measuring Safety Data Report on Gender-Based Violence in Illinois. I'm very proud for our team at the network, particularly our policy advocacy and research team, to launch such a thorough and engaging report. This report addresses two important questions, whose experience matters and what works. I want to express enormous gratitude to the gender-based violence survivors who shared their experiences for this report. In order to end gender-based violence, we have to make sure the experiences of survivors count, even if they can't be counted on a spreadsheet. The survivor who will share her story today will express the challenges they face when seeking help from systems that aren't built for them. It is difficult to hear, but necessary if we're going to fully address the harm caused by gender-based violence. This report also examines what's working well in an effort to highlight where investments can be strategically targeted to support survivors in preventing and ending violence. I wanna thank the direct service providers who contributed measured and experiential data to this report. Your dedicated efforts have saved the lives of thousands, and I hope this report shines a light on how critical your programs truly are in creating shared safety. I would also like to thank the advocates working at our Illinois Domestic Violence Hotline. This report highlights how essential your crisis response is as a first port of call for survivors across our state, from Boone County all the way down to Alexander County. Your dedication to survivors is appreciated by the network and reflected in the record number of calls, texts, and chats you all answered in 2021. One final acknowledgement is to the stakeholders who've come forward to strengthen the safety net for survivors over the past two years. The network is proud to launch today our Leadership Advisory Council, which will provide elected community and business leaders with an opportunity to publicly stand with survivors and advocate for systemic change. With us today are two of our first Leadership Advisory Council members and champions for survivors of gender-based violence in the city of Chicago, Ward 1, 
Ward 1, Alderman Daniel Espada, and 47th Ward Alderman Matt Martin. We thank them both for their stalwart dedication to ensuring that the city of Chicago has the strongest safety net in the country for survivors of gender-based violence. As the executive director of the network, uh, I am proud to present this report and very happy to turn over the mic right now to the Director of Research, Advocacy, um, and Policy at the network, Olivia Farrell. Olivia, take it away. Thank you, Amanda. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, so as Amanda just shared, my name is Olivia Farrell. I am the Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Research for the network. I'm going to provide a overview of what is included in the report along with Christina Velasquez, our policy associate and co-author of the report. Um, we try to give an overview of all of the sections, but encourage you all to kind of take a deeper dive into the report itself, as there's quite a lot of information and much of which we cannot fit into the presentation today. So to start things off, some of the key takeaways of the report, as Amanda highlighted, the report really compares the experience of gender-based violence survivors with different response systems um, and the ways those systems can be harmful or just simply not meet the needs of survivors compared to um, the services provided by gender-based violence service providers. And what we find is that gender-based violence programs truly address the top needs of survivors and are best equipped um, to really help survivors compared to some of these other response systems, um, such as law enforcement, which survivors report having many negative experiences with, um, other programs such as housing and public benefits can come with a lot of barriers and things like private care can be costly and not trauma-informed as folks do not have the same expertise as, um, as gender-based violence service providers. The report also notes that the need for assistance truly remains high. And so as we look at how to best meet that need, really working to prioritize the services that work well, particularly gender-based violence um, service providers and the work that they do. As Amanda mentioned, the network does house the Illinois Domestic Violence Hotline um, and is staffed by our amazing advocates that answer calls, texts, and chats 24 hours a day, seven days a week throughout the entire year. Um, in 2020, we saw a record-breaking year of number of contacts to the hotline. Um, what we analyzed in last year's report um, due at some of the stay-at-home orders um, and escalated incidents of violence um, experienced by survivors. In 2021, we saw um, a continued increase from our already um, record-breaking year for, uh, with a 9% increase in total contacts to the hotline. Um, there were 32,364 individuals who contacted the hotline in 2021 um, with over 30,000 um, coming from calls, um, 1,300 texts, and 385 online chats. Um, a majority of these contacts came from Illinois. Um, we also received uh, contacts from other states as well, whether seeking services in Illinois, or just information in general. Um, but we see the majority of our contacts come from Illinois um, and we received contacts from 90 out of 102 counties um, Illinois. So just increasing the um, hotlines reach throughout the state. Um, and you'll see in our report that there were several counties that experienced very drastic increases in the number of contacts. Some counties even seeing um, double the number of contacts than in previous years. Um, and from counties in the collar counties um, and throughout the state, downstate Illinois. So we're seeing contacts throughout the state um, and continuously increasing the reach of the hotline to ensure that survivors throughout all of Illinois are able to access referrals um, and connection to services, um, and also some of the programs that the network provides. So in addition to the hotline and one program run through our hotline, 
the network offers um, two programs. While the network doesn't um, provide direct services, they provide link to um, different referrals and the service providers that we work with. Um, in addition to that, we have the Network Crisis Response Fund that was created in 2020 to respond um, to the economic impacts that survivors were experiencing during the pandemic. Um, the Crisis Response Fund um, is dependent on different grants um, and allocations um, of funding um, to help provide um, economic assistance to survivors. Um, and so with the available funding in 2021, um, over $110,000 was in emergency funds were distributed um, to 105 survivors that we were able to help through this fund. Um, a majority of those funds, over $95,000, were used for rent and housing. Um, some of the allocations can be dependent on what the grants stipulate that they can be utilized for. Um, and then another $15,000 were used for different household expenses. Um, the network also provides um, transportation to survivors um, through our hotline. Um, and in 2021, we provided 442 Uber rides, um, which allowed for 445 and 66 children um, to be taken to safety. Um, and so our fund and the, hot, and the work of the hotline just demonstrates um, not only the work that the network is doing, but um, as Olivia mentioned, the consistent demand for different services um, and the different needs of survivors that we're seeing. So jumping into some of these different uh, response systems, as Christina just highlighted, we see a huge need for services throughout the state. Uh, I'm just looking at calls to the hotline alone. We see a continual increase in the number of survivors reaching out. And so starting off, we'll look at some of um, the response systems offered throughout the state and how survivors um, reported their experiences with those systems. So the first of which is noting that um, the continuing lethality, specifically in the city of Chicago. Um, so homicides and shootings continue at very high rates with um, domestic violence related shootings increasing 64% from 2020 to 2021 in the city of Chicago. And while homicides did have a slight decrease from 2020 to 2021, the proportion of those that were um, by firearm has continued to grow, really representing the need um, to address this intersection between domestic violence and gun violence. And consistently year after year, we are seeing a disproportionate amount of those victims who are Black individuals, once again, highlighting the way that different systems of oppression in our society intersect with domestic violence and the need to really um, look at some of those systems of oppression as root causes for this violence when we are seeking remedies. And while um, getting homicide and shooting stats throughout the state um, can be very complex. We do um, have information on um, firearm owner identification cards and have found that um, while for um, individuals who have had their FOID cards revoked, um, they are supposed to fill out a firearm disposition record to account for their weapons, but over 60% of those who had their FOID cards revoked did not fill out those forms. Um, so we do not have records of where their weapons reside, indicating that there still is a um, likely chance that those who are causing harm might have access to their weapons. And as we've seen, um, having that access to weapons can really pose a high risk for individuals involved in domestic violence situations. Um, and as was flagged earlier, we do have a survivor who will share her story, um, which really kind of exemplifies the experience of what we heard from many survivors in terms of working with law enforcement, that many survivors um, have very negative experiences. Some survivors um, report 
positive or neutral experiences, especially when working with female officers, um, but the vast majority report these really negative experiences and leaving feeling very dismissed and unheard and ultimately not having their needs met. Um, similarly, folks who work with the um, family regulation system know they have a lot of difficulties and it's been um, noted before that simply having that child removal in any case can be very traumatic for the child. And here we have increasing representation of um, individuals in um, domestic violence situations having involvement with the family regulation system, um, particularly through allegation 60 option B cases, um, which is often referred to as sort of the failure to protect cases. So cases in which um, there is violence happening in the home, not necessarily um, perpetrated towards a child, but that the child is in that home um, and perhaps in need of assistance, but recognizing what we know about survivors and the many challenges um, it can take to leave a violent situation. So looking at other ways in which we can work with adults and children to keep everyone safe, safe. Um, and once again, seeing disproportionate um, amounts of Black children involved in these cases. And um, 2020 really saw an all-time high with over 16,000 cases. And while in 2021, there was fortunately a, a um, slight decrease, we're still pre-COVID levels and really still really high levels of involvement with family regulation. And so once again, looking at ways we can um, support families um, and help keep families together as well. Um, so we also in the report explore survivor experiences with government programs, um, first of which looking at public housing specifically within um, the programs offered by the Chicago Housing Authority. Um, unfortunately, what we see is a very small number of survivors are able to receive housing through that program. So in 2021, only 86 residents with DV status were housed in um, the Chicago Housing Authority public housing program. And um, the wait time on average is still over four years. And so that means many survivors are um, left to fend for themselves and perhaps returning to unsafe situations. Um, and while there are many factors that go into sort of that wait period, um, one of those is that survivors might need larger units, over 60% reported needing at least a two bedroom unit. Additionally, um, a lot of the um, housing options provided by the Chicago Housing Authority might be in unsafe locations either in general or specifically for survivors, if it is still in a location that is near the person who has caused them harm, it might be particularly unsafe for that individual. And they may choose to turn down um, a housing option to prioritize their safety, um, but really across the board, just recognizing that um, these programs aren't able to assist enough survivors and come with many barriers um, and are leaving many survivors still waiting for housing. Um, and so we'll take a look later at kind of how service providers can help fill that need and provide um, more adequate housing. Similarly, um, looking at public benefits. So um, nearly 60% of um, individuals who are working with Illinois DV service providers reported utilizing at least one form of public benefits. And public benefits have been shown to be extremely helpful for survivors, but they are often underutilized. Here we see that only 34 individuals received a temporary assistance for needy families domestic violence waiver in 2021. So looking at ways to improve these programs and increase um, utilization for survivors, but also looking at ways in which service providers can help meet the same needs offered by these programs. Um, and then for survivors experience with private care, uh, many interviewed survivors reported simply having 
uh, working with providers in private care who do not have the proper expertise in gender-based violence, and um, the other major issue with private care is, of course, um, the cost. While many of these services might be covered by health insurance, as you can see, um, over 6,000 um, of adult clients receiving services reported not having any health insurance, um, and many relied on Medicaid or other alternatives. So when um, trying to ask, access programs through private care are going to have a lot of challenges and more limitations, once again, uplifting the need for um, service providers who can offer um, low cost or no cost services and work with survivors, regardless of insurance status. And now I will pass it back to Christina to kind of talk about some of those more successful program models. Yes, and so in this section of our report, we highlight um, gender-based violence service providers um, that um, within key program areas that we identified help address um, very critical needs of survivors, their children, and then also people um, who cause harm. Um, and so exploring these models um, within um, the structure of how they um, help address the needs of survivors um, and their families, um, and really highlighting the work that they're doing um, in 2021 um, in comparison to the pandemic, um, and really showcasing the continued need and demand that they're seeing for survivors, um, and how these models can serve as alternatives or fill in the gaps that some of these, um, whether government programs, private care, um, or even carceral responses um, cannot meet in a trauma-informed way like gender-based violence service providers can. So the service provider program areas that are highlighted within the report focus on programs for children, um, housing, um, programs that address and help facilitate economic self-sufficiency for survivors, um, programs focusing on medical and wellness, um, and then also community building um, programs, which can include services for those who cause harm, um, addressing um, community violence, um, and then also fostering kind of um, connections between survivors um, and helping to build a community of survivors to support each other in addition to other um, clinical and other supportive services. Um, and so we'll explore on the later slide um, specific different program um, models that we explored within um, the programs for children section. Um, but we see consistently, um, you know, nationally and also throughout Illinois that um, survivors um, a lot of times are also parents. Um, and so when survivors are seeking services, they are not only seeking services to support them through um, you know, the experience and the situation that they're going through and how they can overcome trauma and harm, um, but also seeking services for their children as well. Um, because we see that experiencing violence in the home um, is considered an adverse um, child, childhood experience, which can impact um, social, emotional, academic development of children. Um, and so gender-based violence service providers um, have put in place these programs to address that trauma and to be able to facilitate success for children who have experienced violence um, through their different programming that's available. Um, and we see in Illinois that many of our survivors do report being parents. Um, and so 94% um, of contacts to the hotline who did provide that information on whether or not they had dependents um, reported that they did have children. Um, and so these contacts can come from survivors themselves. We also have contacts to the hotline um, from third parties. So individuals calling on behalf of survivors to help them seek services. Um, and so we see that this is um, a critical need of survivors and their families to really have access to services for children. Um, and while we did see a decrease in the number of child clients served in 2020 um, because of stay at home orders and different closures of programs, um, we're seeing that number increase again within 2021 and expected to continue to increase um, with the amount of child survivors um, 
child clients that need these services. Um, and our program providers are really finding different ways um, to provide these services, even with the ongoing pandemic. So the three key um, program areas that we highlight um, are focused on counseling, um, some more clinical services to address, again, um, the impacts of violence, addressing the trauma, how to create um, coping mechanisms and skills for children to be successful, um, supervised visitation and safe exchange programs, which allow um, survivors and the person causing harm um, to parent their children in a safe um, environment, whether through visitations that are supervised by staff that enable, for example, people who cause harm to interact with their children um, safely, but also making sure we're prioritizing the needs of survivors and their children. Um, and then also safe exchange programs, which allow for the survivor to avoid contact with the person who caused them harm um, to ensure their safety, but um, also being able to adhere to court orders that they may have or desires to maintain a parenting relationship um, even after they've left that harmful relationship. Um, and then we also highlight safe from the start programs. So those programs um, focus on children ages zero to five um, and addressing um, different adverse childhood experiences early on, focused mainly on whether domestic violence, also the impacts of community violence and how that impacts children. Um, and so really being able to serve children from a very early age so they can start developing those skills and those coping mechanisms similar to the way that they would do in counseling, but just starting children off at a younger age to be able um, to ensure their kind of success and their ability um, to address and overcome some of these um, negative um, experiences that they've had. Next, we see housing continues to be um, a critical need for survivors. We continue to see demand um, for various forms of housing from shelter to transitional and rapid rehousing, also permanent housing um, is a continued need for survivors. Um, and support for these different programs is really essential to ensure that survivors um, are able to leave their harmful relationship and start creating that independence and economic stability they need for themselves and then also their families. Um, unfortunately, we do still see survivors um, and their children turned away from shelter. Um, the capacity of shelters throughout the state just cannot meet the demand um, for survivors that are seeking emergency shelter. So we saw in um, the city of Chicago um, and the suburban shelters that we do, we did see 187 days um, in Chicago with no cribs available, 69 with no beds and 67 with no beds or cribs. Um, and we still see numbers even within our suburban shelters as well. Um, and so this amounted to over 44,000, um, 4,400, I'm sorry, um, survivors in Illinois turned away from shelter with over 2,600 adults and 1,800 children. Um, and so support for these programs is really essential to ensure that those who are seeking safety, who have taken that brave step to seek safety and leave their harmful relationship um, are met with the housing resources that they need um, to create that stability. And so within this section, we explore um, shelter, as I mentioned, the continuing need um, that survivors express when they're seeking services. Um, in addition to transitional and rapid rehousing, um, we saw increases to the hotline um, seeking services for affordable housing. Um, and so as market prices increase, survivors need additional help in being able to find housing that is accessible to them, affordable, um, and a lot of these transitional rapid rehousing programs within our gender-based violence service providers also provide wraparound services that ensure that survivors are not only having their housing need met, but have access to different resources like economic assistance, children's services, um, mental health counseling, and different things that really ensure their success. Um, and not just meeting that one need, but making sure that all their needs are being met. Um, in addition, service providers also um, can provide um, 
assistance for maintaining permanent housing. Um, so whether offering permanent housing units that survivors can stay in um, with no endpoint or requirement, um, or additionally, some service providers are able to offer economic assistance um, for survivors to help with rent, with mortgages, housing costs, and different things like that. Um, so survivors who want to stay in their homes or seek permanent housing instead of um, more temporary forms of housing um, are able to do so and are also supported in that as well. Next, um, the report um, dives into um, economic needs and programs that help promote economic self-sufficiency for survivors. Um, um, we see survivors um, are, may disproportionately be from lower income groups. Um, we saw 42% of survivors served throughout the state in 2021 um, report an income of $500 or less per month. Um, so survivors um, can experience um, economic abuse um, and even domestic violence, different forms of experiencing that violence can negatively impact their financial stability um, in various ways. Um, and so access to programs that can help um, facilitate um, financial stability, whether through economic assistance, educational assistance, to help them meet any of their academic goals. Um, and then also employment assistance um, is an area that we see survivors um, seek services um, to assist them as they're navigating, experiencing violence and also being employed, um, having to have left their employment due to the violence that they were experiencing. Um, and so our service providers um, help address those needs in um, various ways and can offer these different forms of assistance and programs um, in conjunction with each other um, to ensure that survivors um, feel supported um, throughout their other programming, but then also have the financial support um, to create that independence and stability. So we highlight programs that are able to provide direct financial assistance, um, financial and employment trainings, um, to really assist with being able to gain employment, maintain employment, um, and create that sense of independence. Um, and then also um, programs that address the needs of survivors through the Victims Economic Security and Safety Act, which protects employees who are experiencing domestic violence or have a family member experiencing domestic violence um, to ensure that they have the legal protections, they have access to um, unpaid leave for experiencing that violence um, and ensuring that employers can't discriminate against survivors um, because of their survivorship. Um, and so all of these programs can really help survivors um, address their economic needs and create that self-sufficiency um, to ensure that um, they're not dependent on the person causing harm. Um, we see a lot of survivors um, because of economic needs and, um, and needs related to financial stability um, have to go back to the person causing them harm because they're not able to build that stability themselves. And so these programs help address and help also avoid that situation to ensure that survivors are able to be, um, you know, self-sufficient and successful. And then next we have programs that address um, the medical health and wellness needs of survivors. Um, and so in 2021, we saw over 20,000 clients um, utilize telephone counseling, um, which was 23% more than those who relied on in-person counseling services. Um, we saw a shift due to the pandemic um, towards telephone counseling. Um, and we still continue to see this trend in 2021, even as some programs have opened up to in-person services, um, we still see that many survivors um, are utilizing telephone counseling for various reasons, whether it's more accessible to them, and more convenient for them, um, and things like that. So we're still continuously seeing a need for mental health services um, from survivors um, and our service providers being able to um, assist those survivors in, in different ways that um, are accessible for, you know, meet the survivor's needs. Um, 
we also saw a drastic increase in um, contacts to the hotline regarding medical advocacy. Um, and so I'll kind of discuss on the next slide what those programs look like and how they help um, survivors meet the need. But compared to 2020 and even 2019, um, we're seeing more survivors seeking out this service. So the programs highlighted in this section include mental health counseling, as I said, with the various forms within in-person, telephone counseling, remote counseling as well, um, and then also medical advocacy and hospital-based programs. So medical advocacy um, is able to advocate for, for survivors. Um, some of them exist within the hospital system. Um, so a survivor may come in, present with um, that they're experiencing domestic violence, um, an advocate, a medical advocate will be contacted and they'll be able to provide safety planning, talking through options um, with the survivor um, at that time when they're seeking um, medical care. Um, and we've seen with domestic violence and also sexual violence survivors um, that this was a really critical service that they received. It introduced them to the services that they would go on um, to participate in within um, different service provider programs um, and help them get connected um, to not only these programs, but other survivors as well throughout those services. Um, a lot of times survivors mention that without the medical advocacy or hospital-based advocacy that they received, um, they wouldn't have known who to contact or where to go um, to help address the trauma and their situation that they were experiencing. Um, and then with that, um, we also highlight group counseling. Um, and so in these support group models, we see survivors um, speak to the positive impacts that they've seen in participating in these programs because they really feel um, that they're not alone and they have people who understand their experience. Um, and so we see this within domestic violence and also sexual violence survivors. Um, really appreciated the opportunity to be able to connect with other survivors um, with still um, having a facilitator um, address kind of the mental health impacts, but just more in a group setting. And then lastly, we have um, our community building program section. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the, this section really seeks to highlight um, different programs that are helping um, create and foster a community for survivors, um, but also addressing domestic violence and different forms of gender-based violence um, on the community level. Um, and so we see that um, hotline contacts for um, partner abuse intervention programs, which are services for those who cause harm, um, increase from 2020. Um, and so these can be survivor seeking services, people who cause harm calling the hotline seeking services. Um, so we're seeing that increase potentially go back to pre-pandemic levels um, of individual seeking services. And PAPE services can help address um, the trauma that could be experienced by people who cause harm in their life, helping create accountability for their behavior, um, and then also just helping facilitate healthy um, and safe relationships within our communities. Um, also, um, the Illinois Domestic Violence Hotline has a partnership with um, communities partnering for peace. Um, so uh, as a part of that partnership, we saw in 2021, um, over 3,700 um, crime prevention information center homicide and shooting notifications um, were responded to in addition to 924 um, homicide calls. Um, so really addressing the connection that we see between community violence and domestic violence um, and how we can better support our communities um, in addressing both issues, because we do see how interconnected that they are. So some of the programs we see within um, this section is survivor connection. Um, so there are different programs that, um, in addition to the models of group counseling, have a, a non-clinical um, group support setting for survivors. So this can include um, going on outings together um, within the city that include staff and um, to ensure that the survivors are safe, but that survivors can um, 
you know, feel supported and being able to go out and do different things um, while also having those connections with different survivors. Um, in addition to different mentorship programs that um, are also between survivors. So survivors that have gone through programs within our service providers that have come back um, and wanting to be mentors and letting um, survivors who are newly going through the process of addressing their trauma and the violence that they experienced that they're not alone and that there's someone that has gone through it and, and can attest to, um, you know, utilizing the programs and their ability to work through their experience as well. Um, we also see um, different programs for working with those who cause harm, um, whether within the um, CAPE setting um, or also new innovative programs to address um, the needs of those who cause harm that are um, working at the more community level to have more um, educational groups, accountability circles, um, and things like that, that are not necessarily reliant on carceral referrals um, from the court system, um, but being able to identify those who cause harm at the community level um, without carceral involvement um, to making sure that we're creating that accountability um, and healthy relationships. Um, in our communities that need it most. And then also, um, as I mentioned, our communities partnering for peace um, partnership um, within our hotline. Um, and so again, just addressing that connection between um, community violence, um, gun violence and domestic violence um, and understanding that to address one, we need to address each of them um, to kind of create more peaceful and healthy relationships and also creating um, safer communities. Okay, so following um, that analysis of all of these different response systems and the wonderful programs that are offered throughout the state, um, we conclude the report with the following recommendations. So first, increasing gender-based violence data collection and availability. I believe this will probably be a recommendation every year as each year we um, you know, do our best to provide a comp comprehensive overview of the experiences of survivors throughout the state, but we are always limited by what data is available. Um, so, for example, with this year, looking at um, survivor interactions with the healthcare system, unfortunately, access to that data is still very limited. So while we know anecdotally and through national studies that survivors will frequently turn to healthcare as one of their first places for receiving services, we really don't have um, the information on how often that is incur occurring throughout Illinois. Similarly, as I highlighted earlier, um, while we have great information from um, Chicago in terms of homicides and shootings, we really don't have that information for the state as a whole. Um, so while we try to piece together um, more um, statewide trends, um, there's still a lot of information we don't know. And of course, there's always going to be survivors that are just simply not captured in any of the data we collect. So I'm um, continuing to find new ways in terms of how we measure gender-based violence throughout the state in terms of um, working more to capture um, some folks who might not be utilizing current systems. Um, we also are looking to see um, the increased financial investments in direct services to be continued. Um, so both the city and state recently made substantially um, substantial investments for direct services. So the city recently allocated $35 million for gender-based violence services, marking a $25 million increase while the state um, allocated over $70 million for gender-based violence services, uh, marketing a $50 million increase. So both very historic and wonderful investments. So we're looking to see um, those sustained and continue to um, fund these very important services. Similarly, looking to increase awareness and connection to community-based resources. Um, 
the survivors we interviewed by and large really talked about this idea that after going through these very traumatic events, they were left not knowing where to go, where to turn, what was made available to them. There is a story included in the report regarding a survivor who was at a hospital and happened to see um, some signage regarding one of the medical advocacy programs within that facility and were able to um, get connected to resources. So finding those different ways to meet survivors really where they're at and where they're turning for help, being there to work with them and to help address their needs. And lastly, prioritizing gender-based violence services over other systems of response. So as is really um, covered within the report, some of um, the other response systems that are outside of service provision um, don't necessarily meet the needs of survivors, as well as services by gender-based violence service providers. So as we look at increasing rates of domestic violence and increasing lethality, the severity of that violence, really looking to turn to gender-based violence service providers who have the expertise and the skills um, to really meet the needs of survivors in a um, in kind of every facet. With that, um, I will take some time to answer some questions and I see there's already a few in the chat. I'm gonna stop sharing just so I can more easily see the questions. Um, so, okay, I'm trying to go through all the chats. Um, Um, okay, so, sorry, um, let's see. Trying to see questions. Um, I know Amanda's been trying to keep up with the chat as well. Um, so let's see. Um, so we have a question. Can you expound on data collection for trans survivors? Uh, excellent question. Um, yeah, throughout the report, we do really report on sort of the gender binary of male and female. Um, and that, once again, when we talk about the need for additional data collection and availability, um, that is definitely a big piece is that most of the data that is currently collected um, really does not account for folks who don't fit into the binary or for trans individuals. Um, though we know kind of nationally that trans folks and um, folks who fall under the LGBTQ umbrella are at higher risk, again, just referring back to the systems of oppression within society. And so folks who are facing that different oppression that's gonna carry over into the violence in relationships. Um, and so something we definitely are always working towards is being able to account for those groups a little more, but there's definitely a need for more data collection and um, particularly working with providers and other folks who do this data collection to expand their own models to account for those folks. Um, and there's been a couple of questions on um, accountability um, that I'll actually uh, um, turn over to Christina to respond to. Yeah, so the question was about um, one of the programs that I mentioned that is um, facilitating accountability circles for those who cause harm. Um, and so that program is the Peace Within Chicago Homes program. Um, at Metropolitan Family Services. It's a newer program that they're launching um, to address um, not only accountability for those who cause harm, um, but also um, the experiences of those who cause harm as well. Um, and so the program allows for community members to call their hotline um, to seek services and, and to be a part of the program. Um, and so it doesn't require um, any carceral referrals, any court orders or anything like that. 
Um, and so really allowing the community to come forward and seek services for themselves or other individuals that they know um, without having to be involved in the carceral system that we know um, is harmful for a lot of different individuals in our communities, especially different marginalized communities and communities of color. Um, and so this program starts with educational workshops um, and then has accountability circles um, and kind of long-term accountability for community members in addressing their behavior um, and things like that. Um, and all the while and th throughout while um, community members are participating in the program, um, they're able to receive wraparound services as well. So we see um, survivors have that ability to receive wraparound services. And so this program is implementing also um, wraparound services for those who cause harm. Um, we know that those who cause harm usually have, um, you know, past experiences, whether childhood experiences with domestic violence, experiences with community violence, gun violence, and things like that. Um, so ensuring that accountability is prioritized, but also addressing um, those additional experiences that might have contributed to that behavior and really teaching communities at the local level about healthy and safe relationships. All right, I see an additional question, the chat from Alderman Martin um, regarding the DFS um, funds and whether they had been dispersed, which I think Amanda might be simultaneously answering. Um, but while the city has been working on RFPs and selecting um, organizations that has uh, that will receive those funds, those funds um, are still pending disbursement. Um, so hopeful to see those funds go out the door. So as kind of highlighted in the report and um, what's been stated, obviously really quite a large need for those programs. So hoping to see those funds go to good use soon. Um, Sorry, um, a lot of questions in the chat. And I did um, provide my email um, for additional um, questions. If folks um, have, and if we have additional time at the end, I might answer some additional questions. Um, but being mindful of time, I wanna give space um, for the survivor who's joined us today, Jasmine, to speak. So I will turn it over to her. Hello, <clears throat> good morning. Um, so on the evening of October 1st, 2019, uh, I went to visit my ex-boyfriend. I had originally planned on breaking up with him that night. Instead, I ended up consoling him about a friend of his who had just committed suicide the week prior. By 2 a.m. the next morning, I had been drugged and raped by him. I could barely even keep my eyes open while telling him uh, I could barely keep my eyes open while telling him to stop until I had completely passed out. That night irreparably changed my life forever. The next morning when I left, I felt dead inside. Once I got home, I crawled in bed and just cried. I confronted him through a phone call a few days after, uh, which was the last time I had directly spoken to him. He screamed at me and said, why would I put him in this position? And I could have just gone home. After that conversation, I opened up to the first close friend about what had happened. I eventually told my mom a few weeks later and we had both cried in her car as I told her. She took me to file a police report, even though it had been a month later. I still wanted to report him. <clears throat> this was the beginning of a still ongoing downward spiral with the police department handling my case. The initial officer was compassionate and understanding because she even expressed how she had just went through this process with her sister. However, the detective that I was eventually assigned did the bare minimum and continues this behavior to this day. When I went to meet him at the office, he showed me an old picture that he'd pull up on that he pulled up on my rapist and said he'd do everything he could. The detective sent out an officer once in January of 2020. He went, she went to the wrong house, even after I'd sent Uber receipts with the address and a picture of the duplex on Google Maps. 
No one ever looked for him again. I called the detective almost every week to desperately get updates to no avail. I contacted every possible organization at my disposal only to be turned away, including, including the state's attorney's office. I even had a legal advocacy group tell me that my assaulter had contacted them for representation so that they could not take me on. I got a hold of resilience um, through YWCA. After, after a while, um, I eventually was assigned an initial advocate from resilience. She reached out to the detective every week on my behalf. He either never returned our calls or was always on vacation. Resilience has literally been the only organization alongside YWCA to provide me with trauma therapy and a lawyer to acquire a restraining order over the course of seven arduous months. I've had people bully me for being raped. I lost some friends who thought that I was lying. My assaulter had people calling me and harassing me at a point, including his own mother. Many people didn't understand that my anger towards the police was compound. I feel like my case has been shoved to the side because I'm a black woman from the South side. So maybe it didn't matter to them. The police have done nothing. Even after giving every possible amount of evidence, phone numbers, jobs, locations, even after speaking to supervising sergeants and separate, separately opening a case to investigate the detective with COPA, which was, prompt, which was promptly closed because they claimed my original case was still being investigated. This circumstance has mentally tormented me and made me at that time want to die every single day. It's been, excuse me, it's been a constant nightmare that I remain stuck in almost three years later. Rape is an isolating trauma that changes you forever. Writing this has been very difficult, but I'm glad that I can share my experience um, and maybe help someone else. Thank you for your time. <laughs> uh, back to Olivia. Thank you, Jasmine. And I see the chats um, full of a lot of folks supporting you as well. Uh, we do truly appreciate your courage for sharing that. Um, and, you know, it is just a terrible thing that these um, systems failed you um, as, uh, you know, we've stated a lot of survivors, unfortunately, go through the same thing. Um, so we are hopeful that services and service providers such as resilience and WCA that you highlighted and so many others um why WCA um can help folks um and for all the um folks in the chat thinking Jasmine or um who have motivated for her motivated by her story or would like to get involved with a network um would like to take some time to um, show you some of the ways that you can get involved. Um, so if you give me one moment to get my screen set. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen once more. Okay, so I'll um, bring you to the um, network's website we have right here. You can click to read the report. It will have a um, recording of the webinar once it is finished, um, but currently has a copy of um, the report, the executive summary, um, other ways you can get involved. Um, and sorry, the Zoom tools are blocking my tabs. Um, <laughs> give me one second and I will reshare. Um, is, um, We'd also encourage you to um, sign up for our policy alerts. Um, so you can do so by navigating to the Action Center on 
our website. Um, you can also do so by texting network GBV all caps to 52886. Um, we will also put that in the chat. Um, and that way, when we are working with um, elected officials, like some of the wonderful folks who have joined us on the call, um, as well as so many others to advocate for survivors, such as Jasmine, um, to advocate for funding for these services and to be able to better serve folks throughout the community. We will put out all of those alerts on um, through this tool if you sign up. Um, and then you can also subscribe to our newsletters to be informed about all of the items um, that are happening. Um, okay, and I see, thank you, Ellie, for dropping that link in the chat and a lot of wonderful messages to Jasmine um, and we'll make sure um, we can save those so you can get a copy too. Um, okay, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, and I will put that code in the um, chat again. That's network GBV to 52886. Um, and if you text that, you can get signed up um, or you can sign up on our website. Um, but thank you, everyone. Um, we'll give um, some sp space for um, Jasmine to read all of your lovely messages, but everyone have um, a wonderful rest of your day um, and keep an eye out um, for updates on the report that will be emailed. Thank you so much.